the talk uh, is going to be about um, uh, elementary uh, higher toposes having a natural number object. Please. Uh, all right. Uh, so thank you to the organizers for giving me a chance to speak and thank you all for being here. So this is a talk on uh, like an ongoing project on studying um, so topos theoretic and specifically like elementary topos theoretic phenomena in like the higher categorical setting. And there's something I specifically I like about this title because uh, unlike many foundations talks I give, this one already has like a specific sentence. Like the title already tells you what the talk is going to be about. There's an object and has a certain property. Um, so the talk is obviously not going to be very long. It's 20, 25 minutes. And so I have to skip um, some of the details of the proofs that I would have liked to give. And so if there's anything that's interesting to you, then uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can talk, meet, whatever. I would love to talk more about this, but I also want to respect the time here of this conference. I know it's like a long day. All right, so let's go into the topo theory part. So this should be familiar more or less to most of you. Um, you can like break down toposes in various ways. And this conference has been like, a great example of like the different kind of perspectives on the topos. But like, so one way to think about toposes is like, there's like a good unique perspective that arose like in the study of like, algebraic geometry in a proof key setting. And then there's like an elementary um, perspective so the elementary toposes, which is like maybe more connected to like type theory other stuff. And they're uh, obviously connected, but also have like their differences. And so Grundig toposes are in some sense like very nice. They have like lots and lots of amazing properties. Uh, they're like locally Cartesian closed, they're in particular locally presentable and they have subject classifiers. And so we can use them to do lots of math. Um, unfortunately, elementary toposes are not as nice. So they, they lose some of these properties. So in particular elementary topos is by default not locally presentable. And we still have some limiting co-elements but only the finite ones. We don't have infinite co-elements. And we only preserve some of the like the theorem, like axioms that you have in Giro's theorem. So for example, um, um, co-products are still disjoint, but not all the properties survive. And so the ones that I have um, bolded here are the ones that we take as a definition, right? So we want an elementary topos to be a category that has finite limits, locally cartesian close, and has a subject classifier. And so with any generalization, um, the benefit of it is that we, we gain more examples usually which, um, for example, the category of finite sets is an elementary topos, but it is certainly not written because it doesn't have infinite co-elements. And there are other kind of interesting examples such as filter products or realizability toposes that come up in kind of more foundations and logical frameworks. But then the drawback of the more examples is that it's less expressive, right? So there's a bunch of stuff that we cannot prove anymore. And in some sense, the way I think about it is there's like this intuitive sense of like something infinite. And if something is infinite, then it's harder to like construct it in the in the elementary setting. Whereas in good nature process, you very often can use local presentability to get this. And so one thing we want is something that intermediate. So we want to strengthen the notion of, of an elementary topos without going all the way, like without actually going all the way to a good nature topos, which has local presentability. And one way of doing that is by the notion of a natural number object, which is like an object we add to elementary topos to like strengthen the theory. So, and because this talk is a lot about natural number object, let me actually give you like definitions and there will be several and each one of them kind of hinges on focusing on certain aspects of natural numbers in, in the category of sets. So one way to think about natural numbers is that, okay, it's an infinite set, which means it has like a, uh, an injective but not surjective self-injection, which cannot happen for a finite set. And so if you try to use that to form some kind of axiomatic definition, you end up with a freight natural number object, which is just an object along with the point and an endomorphism so that we have these two following two column diagrams. Then another aspect of natural numbers is well induction. So we know that natural numbers have like the inductive property from a piano axiom. And we can make that into like some kind of axiomatic definition, i.e. we have in natural numbers, we have an object, we have the point, and we have this endomorphism, which is like a successor map. And now we say, okay, whenever we have a subobject that is closed under zero and the successor, then it's just the object itself, which is precisely the categorical statement of induction. If one is in there and if n implies n plus one, then your whole thing. And then the final version 
which is, I think, the one that most people might have seen before. So it's the one that if you just Google natural number object, it's probably going to like show up first, is um, the Lavier natural number object. And that just says, okay, it's an object along with a point and endomorphism that is initial with that data. So whenever I have another object with some endomorphism U and a point B, then I get a unique map. And that unique map just defines a kind of recursive function, which just applies U n times to the object. And so I have now three notions and all of three, all of these three capture a certain aspect of N. And fortunately, all of these three coincide in certain elementary topos. And that is why we usually don't actually distinguish. So if you're just reading like a paper, they will not distinguish between these notions. They will just say you have an elementary topos plus natural number object. Because whichever notion you pick, it is equivalent to the other two. So that's why we usually don't really matter, don't care about this distinction. And now let me come back to my original promise. So as soon as we have a natural number object in our elementary topos, we can now prove new results that we couldn't do before. And there are many examples of that. I, I want to focus on one here. Uh, as soon as our elementary topos has a natural number object, we get free monoids. And the equation for the free monoid is explicitly given by, by this formula here, uh, where like N1 is called the universal finite cardinal, and it's just constructed out of a product of the natural number object in itself. And so notice this. Here, the existence of the natural number object is necessary, right? It's like actually sufficient and necessary, but let's not focus on that. It is actually necessary. In fact, if it doesn't exist, this would fail. And easy example is finite sets. Inside the category of finite sets, I don't have free moments. Even a free moment on a point or something doesn't exist because it wants to be N itself and N is not a finite set. So the assuming that the natural number object is necessary to get such results. Okay, so... Um, before I move on to the more general uh, high category stuff, let me summarize what we did. So we can define an elementary topos. We want to prove some stuff like we want to construct free monoids or other similar stuff. For that, we have several notions of natural number object that all coincide. Uh, assuming the existence of such an object, we can prove that we have free monoids, for example. But if you don't assume it, we cannot. So it's, it's independent of the axioms of the elementary topos. All right, so this was in some sense like a, I guess, with you. So depending on who you are, this might or might not have been very familiar to you. So now the next step is I wanna move into the world of like Fini category stuff and wanna see, okay, how does this, how does this picture look like in Fini categories? Do we, have, do we have natural number objects or not? And what do they imply? And because I'm now using the, the word infinity category, then I, I should like say something about what I mean by that. Uh, and so let me just give you like a, like a one slide summary. So if, if you're already familiar, or if you did attend the, the first lecture of the, the, the higher topos school last week by, by Charles Resk, then you should probably be already familiar with infinity categories to some extent. If, if not, then just take this, this one, I will just give this one slide summary. So for the purpose of this talk, an infinity category is just like a, there's a collection of objects, so X, Y, whatever. And for any two objects, there's a mapping space. And that is really important. I really want to fix that I have a space of maps from X to Y, where space can either mean topological space or Kahn complex, that doesn't matter. And then that those spaces should give me some sort of weak enrichment, uh, meaning that whenever I have like two maps so that the codomain and domain are appropriate, I have some kind of composition, but the composition is only chosen up to some contractible ambiguity. And then that composition is also associative, but again, associative only up to some homotopies and, and so on. And all the classical categorical terms, all the classical definitions in category theory, limits, adjunctions, Cartesian closure, um, adjoint functor theorem, presentability, all, all of those notions appropriately generalized to this infinite categorical setting. And that can be done um, either using like quasi categories or an infinity cosmoi or complete Siegel spaces. But for the purpose of the talk, this is all I need. Like I will use some terms, like high category terms, but just believe that they exist if they're not familiar to you. So now with this one slide, we all have mastered infinity category theory. So we can move on to uh, what infinity categories you want to focus on. Um, 
So the main goal is to apply this to an elementary infinity of us, as the title suggests. And so how you want to define elementary infinity of us, we would certainly want the conditions that you can already find in an elementary topos, i.e. finite limits and colimits, local collision clause, and subobject classifier. And then you additionally want some kind of object classifier universe. The, the issue is the exact notion of like universe you want is a little bit up to debate. So there's like, you can kind of decide on how strict the universe should be or how functorial or how close it is on a certain construction. And the claim I want to make is that it really doesn't matter for the purposes of this talk, whichever notion of universe you think of, the result I claim holds. So in order to kind of make this stronger claim, I will just not use the universe and we use some weaker condition that just follows from any notion of universe that is out. So instead of using universe, I just use finite descent. And uh, a finite descent is, is like a, is like the descent condition, which was introduced by also by Charles Reckon in the second lecture. And it's, it's about like the interaction between pullbacks and pushouts. The finite I'm using here is only because well, we don't have infinite colimits. Like the definition here you know, is finite colimits. And so for finite colimits, we have the descent condition. And the it, descent condition follows from any notion of universe that is out there. And that also suffices for the result I want to state. So I don't even need to go to the strength of the whole universe. I just need the descent condition. That's enough. And before I move on, let me note that as soon as you have an infinite category which has these properties, I can take the subcategory of zero truncated objects. And that subcategory will be an elementary topos because it will still have finite limits, be local collision closed, and have a subject classifier. And I can make a nice bonus. And notice this definition does have like lots of examples. Uh, the, the, the most stereotypical example is the infinity of spaces. But then you also get pre sheets, you also get all higher toposes in, in the sense of like Lurie or Resk or something. But in addition to those, you also get like non presentable examples such as filter product between toposes. So there's like a bunch of examples of, of this condition I stated. Okay, so now we have a certain infinity category we want to study. What do we want to study about it? Natural number objects. So what is an appropriate notion of a natural number object in the infinity setting? And because I've already defined them in the, the one setting, I'll give just like a bullet summary um, how they would look like in the infinity setting. And for freight and piano, uh, the generalization is, is pretty straightforward, right? So the freight natural number object is just, you have two certain diagrams of columnar diagrams. And I can just make exactly the state statement. I still have exactly the same diagram and just say that those are not polymer diagrams, but inside some infinity category. And for a piano, it's the same. I mean, I just want a certain sub object that is closed under OS to be the same as the original object. Again, you can just phrase that. And the fact that you now in some kind of high categorical setting has no influence on, on the definition. Um, Lavier natural number objects are not like that. So for a Lavier natural number object now, I need to actually strengthen the condition. I need to say that whenever I have a triple of an object X and some endomorphism U with a map from the point B, then I have a space of maps from the natural number object to, to X, and I want that space to be contractible. So that, that is very different from the more classical categorical setting where we have a set of morphisms and we want that to be unique. So there's no uniqueness anymore. There's only contractibility. So it's like a much weaker form. Um, but yeah, so piano and freight are pretty much similar, I would say. So we have defined our infinity categories and the natural number object. So I'm finally in a position where I can state the, the main result. And the main result is that if E satisfies the condition I stated before, so it's local collision closed, finitely by complete, and satisfies finite descent and has a subject classifier, then all three notions of natural number object coincide and exist. And so that last point is, is very important. And unlike the classical setting, I can prove the existence from these axioms and also that they coincide. Okay, so uh, let me give like a summary of the proof. So in, in an ideal world, I would like to spend the next like, I guess 25 minutes on this proof, but I don't have 25 minutes. So let me just have the next five minutes on this proof. And the fun fact about this proof is that it breaks down nicely into like three almost completely independent steps. And so the first step is 
motivated by results from, uh, I guess, any introduction to algebraic topology course in, in school, right? So, so if you go to like any uh, intro to algebraic topology course, the first result they will probably teach you is that pi one of S one is Z. And so I want to categorify that result. I want to take a more general view of that. And so how can I do that? I just think of, okay, Z is the free group on one generator. So really what I'm saying is that pi one of S one is the free group on one generator. And then even more generally, okay, I don't want really pi one of S one, I just want the loop loops on S one. So pi one is like, the, the homotopy class of loops, but I can just ignore the homotopy part and just say I want loops on S1. And then loops of S1 can be expressed in any category with finite limits and co-limits. So if that is not familiar, then you just have to test me on that. That I can always write a circle as a certain co-limit and I can write the loops on the circle as a certain limit, a certain pullback. And now the statement then becomes, um, if you have a category with like these settings, as a matter of fact, all I need is finite limits, finite co-limits and descent then I can form loops on S1 and loops on S1 will be the free group on one generator. It will satisfy the universal property of it. And so that's like the first step and it's motivated clearly by like background knowledge and algebraic topology. And then the next step is, if you recall, as soon as I have this E, I have an underlying elementary topos. And now you just use kind of very classic literature on this that proves that is whenever you have an elementary topos and you have the free group on one generator, you have a natural number object. You can just construct it, right? So you use this object classifier and you carve out the N out of the Z basically. So that's like a very kind of summary step of the proof, right? That when you have Z and it's like a sub element, like a sub object of that and you just get it out of it. And so after step two, then you prove that the underlying elementary topos has a natural number object. What you want then to prove is that, okay, this underlying elementary to this natural number object in the underlying element topos is also not an object in the whole infinity category. So there's like a lifting kind of argument. And that doesn't follow obviously at first. The, the thing is, as I explained, so the freight and piano conditions are very similar. So as soon as they hold in the underlying one category, they will hold also in the infinity category. There's not that much more effort. Like you have a certain collimate diagram and you just want to check that the same collimate diagram is also a collimate diagram in the infinity category. So there's, there's some work, but it's not too bad. The, the main challenge of the proof and something like the hardest step is to show that this, if you assume that's a Lavier natural number object in the underlying elementary topos, then it is also a Lavier natural number object in the infinity category. And that is quite challenging because now you, you're making it like, you're strengthening the claim quite a lot. You're going from a statement about uniqueness of maps to contractibility of some mapping spaces. And that's just not obvious. And that is also the part where, unfortunately you cannot just use elementary topos methods because elementary toposes don't really work with like homotopy stuff. And so the trick then is, is to like, um, use the wisdom of homotopy tech theorists because they, they have been thinking a lot about uh, how logic and homotopy theory kind of interacts. So it's not actually homotopy tech per se, but it just look at their work and like try to get some ideas from there and adapt it to like the categorical setting. And using that, you can then find an appropriate proof that if you have a Lavier natural number object in the underlying element topos, it will also be a Lavier natural number object for the whole thing. All right, uh, cool. I still have a lot of time. So uh, I wanna move on to the who cares part. So now that we have a natural number object, I can use it to do, what, what, what's the point of it? And let me focus on like three examples and one future direction. Um, so the first fun fact is, so let me give you some history. Um, the the Gurdnick topos is, it can be lifted to a, a higher topos, like an infinity topos. And it is in fact that whenever you pick any Gurdnick topos, you can find an infinity topos, which um, has that Gurdnick topos as a zero truncation. Um, and that infinity topos is often called the enveloping infinity topos. So this was already known uh, 10, 15 years ago. And one thing one might have expected is that something similar holds in the elementary setting. So whenever I have an elementary topos, I can lift it to some elementary infinity topos in a similar vein. But this result implies that this cannot be true. Um, it's just impossible, right? So for example, the category of finite sets, because it doesn't have a natural number object, can never be the zero truncated objects of any elementary infinity topos. Just not going to happen. And in particular, this also implies that the category of finite spaces cannot be an elementary infinity topos because it doesn't have natural number object. 
And so if you want some kind of like finitary version of spaces that has, that is still like a topos, you have to like aim bigger. So you need to focus on like couple small spaces for some couple that's like satisfy some properties. And this has been studied by Lomo and Akbo in like a recent paper. And like, this is like a, like a nice contrast. And I don't know, it is, I found it surprising. Uh, and another like fun example, uh, fun implication of the existence of NNOs is that we can like study um, infinite colimates. And so there's two aspects that we can use NNOs to study them. One is that, okay, when we have a natural number object, we can kind of reduce and determine quite straightforwardly when our infinity category does have infinite polymets and kind of reduces down to having the corporate of the terminal object. So it's like a useful fact on studying infinite polymets in this elementary infinity topo setting. I think more importantly, it allows us to like define so-called internal sequential limits. And like, unfortunately I don't have enough time to like break down what they are, but we can define like internal sequences inside our infinity categories and then define like the, in, the internal sequential limit of that internal sequence as a certain co-equalizer, which then exists, which is nice. And like using that internal sequential limit, you can actually construct negative one truncations. Um, this is again, one of those results that in the Grittnik infinite topos holds by default. And that was also part of the lectures of the summer school. I think that lecture number three, um, but, and there you just use like local presentability to use it, but here you don't have local presentability. So you use like NNOs to kind of um, circumvent that and get around this issue. And this should remind us of like a similar result in the elementary setting of epimonofactorization, right? So one of the classical results of elementary topos is that you can always factor every map into an epi followed by a mono. And so this is a straightforward generalization of that. Like negative one truncation is precisely like the epimonofactorization of the map. So we cannot just do it without the NNO, but with an NNO, we can get the same result. Um, as, as a last step, so one, one uh, key example of the application of the natural number object in the elementary topo setting was the existence of free monoids. So one natural question that would be, okay, you, you have deduced the existence of a natural number object. So can you now use it to deduce the existence of free like, monoids in your infinity category setting? And the answer is kind of a little disappointing. So I, I guess the answer is, I don't know. I don't know yet at least. And not only that I don't know, but it turns out this question is kind of quite challenging. And so let me end this talk by giving you a sense of what the challenge here is when you're trying to like approach this question. Um, if we, unlike the, the one category setting, in order to define monoids in some kind of infinity category, you use you need to use some kind of like, like algebraic gadget, like so operats or, or the view theories or something. That is because you need to have operations for all possible levels. But then ironically, like an operat itself, the, the definition of an operat sometimes depends on the natural numbers. So you have an operation for every n. And so now the natural question you can ask yourself is, should you use the natural number object that exists inside the topos or should you just use the external one that exists in spaces? And now you might wonder, okay, what's the difference? But it turns out there is a difference. Like in, in certain elementary toposes, there are so-called non-standard natural number objects, which have additional uh, non-standard natural numbers. And so the definition would be different. Like you would get a new and different definition of an operat, which has like additional operations. And they, yeah, that would just not coincide. So the, the first question that could even ask here is when you say monoid, what do you mean? Like, do you mean the monoid where you have just the standard operations or where you also have the additional ones? And so like, not only like, is it challenging to construct it, it's even challenging to define what the appropriate notion should be. And this challenge doesn't arise in the in like in the one setting, right? So when you try to find a monoid inside an elementary topos, uh, you never face the challenge, regardless of what the natural number object is. You never face the challenge of having to define additional operations because it always suffices to like define operations for level like zero, one, and two. You never need the higher levels because your associativity and everything will be strict. This is kind of the challenge that only arises when you try to study um, homotopical algebra, like so higher algebra setting. So, so there seems to be like this. Um, surprising interaction between non-standard natural number and higher algebra that is clearly not well understood and definitely merits further study. So with this, um, I end my talk. Thank you very much.